Right. Good. Good. Good day, Rossi. Right. Good. Good day, everyone. Um, I see, I see uh, folk are all uh, coming in. Just uh, one or two housekeeping uh, arrangements. Uh, if you're not speaking, I'd appreciate if you could just mute your microphone. Um, and that will just avoid uh, any issues of feedback loops and, and that sort of thing happening. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Zoom interface towards the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a microphone that you can toggle on and off. Uh, the challenge, of course, is to remember to unmute yourself when you want to make a contribution to the meeting. Uh, the second housekeeping uh, issue is a bit of a tradition of ours. Uh, when we are discussing decisions, our practice is uh, that silence means assent. So if I don't hear anything from anybody on the floor, uh, while we're taking any decisions, I assume that you, uh, we, we, will, we will assume that you all uh, are in agreement. But of course, anyone and everyone is most welcome to contribute at any time uh, during the meeting. So let me leave it there. And if, perhaps just a quick round of introductions, because this group is not as big as the North American group. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll go in the sequence uh, of uh, participants that I have on my list. Uh, as uh, you came into the meeting. So, uh, Andy, let me hand over to you uh, for a quick introduction. Just... Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Andy Graham. I'm the Head of Academic Development at the University of the Highlands and Islands. We are based in the whole northern part of Scotland. Um, we cover an area the size of Belgium, and I am uh, currently in my home office in Elgin. Thanks, Andy. Um, moving on then, uh, uh, Claire. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Claire Good from Otago Polytechnic in Dunedin in New Zealand. I'm a senior online learning designer in the learning and teaching development team. Thanks, Claire. Welcome. Uh, Gary? Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening. Uh, Gary Campbell, I'm the Dean of uh, Science, Health and Engineering at UHI. Do you want to just join me here, Andy? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, next on my list, I have uh, Helen. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Helen Partridge. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Scholarly Information and Learning Services at the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. Um, and essentially, that means my portfolio looks after our Office of the Advancement of Learning, our teaching, our library services, and a, a unit called the Digital Life Lab. Thanks, Helen. And um, back across uh, the ocean again, uh, Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Weller from the Open University. Um, Andrew's here also, who will introduce himself. So Andrew's the main OERU contact, uh, but I'll be the person coming to Toronto, so that's why I'm, I'm popping in today. Cool. That's great to have you, have you along, Martin. Uh, and uh, you say Andrew's in the room with you then? No, it's, it's, I've just seen him come in. It, I, I'm in Cardiff. Andrew's on oh, campus. Okay. Okay. <laughs> of course. Um, oh, all right. So let me hand over to Andrew then. Hi Wayne, hi everybody, uh, good day. Um, uh, it's Andrew Law, I look after the informal learning output of the Open University, including our OERU and OER activity. Cheers, thanks Andrew, it's great to have you along. Uh, and now across to the African continent, Rossi. Uh, good morning everyone, it's, I'm Rossi Law from Northwest University. Um, I'm representing um, Prof. Robert Belfort our new DVC um, in the place of Prof. Martin Westation. He'll be joining me in just a minute. He's uh, just engaged in another meeting. So uh, we can carry on with the meeting. And then, Wayne, um, I'm, I'm going to put off my video just to make sure that the, that the signal keeps strong on yeah. our side. So I'll be just on audio, if it's okay with you guys. Yes, no, that, that, that's fine. Thanks, Rossi. Conserving bandwidth is not a bad idea. Um, and then, uh, Serene? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sireen and I'm from Hamdan Mohammed Smart University. I'm the Vice Chancellor for International Cooperation and I'm attending and representing on behalf of uh, Prof Mustafa, who is responsible for the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. So nice to see you all virtually. Yes, we're very pleased to have uh, 
United Arab Emirates and Hamdan bin Mohammed Smart University join us for the meeting. Welcome. And uh, next on the list, uh, Jim. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Taylor, an emeritus professor from the University of Southern Queensland. Um, I'm in Brisbane and um, also a member of the OER Foundation Board. So, hello everyone. Here we go. Yeah, thanks, Jim, and appreciate your time as board member coming to join us as well. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the screen share. And so we can have the agenda on screen. Right, I assume that's coming through. If, if the uh, screen share is not coming through, just let me know in the chat window. Okay, so we, we posted the agenda in the wiki. The main, the main aims of this meeting are to review progress with the implementation of the OERU first year of study and the minimum viable technology platform. Um, and true to our traditions, every year we consult on the agenda for the International Partners Meeting, which will be held in October. And uh, also just to relate uh, or to note related projects around you know, marketing and analytics. I, I posted the agenda in the wiki. I didn't receive any uh, additions directly in the wiki, but let me just uh, open the floor here to ask if you would like to add any additional uh, items uh, and uh, in terms of our sort of open consultation practice, I'll take silence to mean assent. So, any additional agenda items? Um, Wayne, I just want to ask from South Africa side: Will the will the whole question of Prof. Martin's representation on the exec be be dealt with in the international partners meeting or, or, at, or at, at this meeting? No, it it will be it will be discussed at the uh, Council of Chief Executive Officers meeting because the that representation position is associated with the Council of CEOs, so okay. that will be discussed at that meeting. Yep. Okay. Thanks, uh, Wayne. Yeah, no problems. Any other agenda points? Uh, silence is good. Okay. Right. Let me, let me move on then. Um, I prepared a, a couple of slides just quickly to summarize where we're at with the uh, implementation of the OERU. So let me just launch that, put that onto full screen. Right. So basically, our, our main focus this year has been the uh, implementation of the OERU first year of study. And uh, as you are aware, there are two exit awards that are proposed, or you know that will be. Uh, implemented. Uh, the first is the Certificate of Higher Education in Business, OERU, that will be conferred by the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, this, uh, the credential has been validated by UHI subject to the implementation of uh, a, a, a couple of additional requirements and, you know, Andy's working on that. So the course basically comprises a 60 core uh, 60 core credits, uh, the three courses that are listed there in uh, UK terminology, those are modules of uh, 20 credits each or 200 notional learning hours uh, that will be assembled by UHI and assessed by UHI. And a number of optional courses, uh, 60 credits are required. And you can see there from the list of courses, we will have uh, 94 credits available. Uh, so the learners will have some choice. Uh, the green arrows there uh, represent courses that have been published and are ready for launch as we speak. Uh, the progress bars at the bottom are courses that are more than 75% complete and will be completed by the, uh, the partners meeting and ready to go. The other qualification uh, that we have for the uh, NDP is the Certificate of General Studies that will be conferred by Thompson Rivers University. Uh, TRU has a residency requirement of two courses or six North American credits. Um, as you will see there, those courses are basically nearing comp or completed and or nearing completion. And then we will also have a, a number of arts courses, 26 credits that will be available, North American credits, as you can see listed there. 
And of course, uh, a number of the business courses could also be recognized towards the Certificate of General Studies. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at in the line of courseware. Um, I just want to re-emphasize that the OERU credit transfer system is designed to operate within existing institutional policy and all our partners retain decision-making autonomy over all aspects of credit transfer. Uh, we've also completed the uh, completed in collaboration with the active partners engaged with assessment services and or credit transfer recognition towards these awards, a credit transfer contract, uh, which has been approved by the respective registrars at the active institutions. Um, a, couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I circulated a copy of the contract for any partners that would want to make inputs or you know, get to see what the contract looks like. Uh, the, credit cons the credit transfer contract that we've assembled was based on the guidelines that we approved at the 2015 uh, partners meeting in South Africa. Uh, we have also uh, established a partnership with EduBits, which is a new micro-credentialing initiative uh, that is led here at Otago Polytechnic. Uh, there was also an announcement by the New Zealand Minister of Tertiary Education, Skills and Employment announcing three uh, national prototypes uh, looking at the whole landscape of micro-credentialing here within New Zealand. And the EduBits OVRU partnership pilot is one of the designated uh, projects that the, the ministry is having a closer look at. And basically, I mean, how this would work is we've assembled all uh, our OERU courses as, as, as micro courses. Um, each micro course equates to roughly 40, to 40 or 50 notional learning hours. So basically how this would work, a learner would be able to request assessment services for each one of the micro courses. If they are successful, they will receive a digital certification. If the learners uh, complete the digital certifications for each of the micro courses, a target polytechnic will issue transcript credit, which would then be recognized towards the Certificate of Higher Education uh, in Business. We uh, have announced a soft launch schedule uh, commensurate with the decision at the previous uh, uh, Council of CEOs meeting to proceed with a realistic, uh, we proceed with very realistic and uh, conservative targets as we build brand awareness and collect data uh, for the project. We announced three phases, well, uh, two phases. The first phase will be the launch of the learning in a digital age course. Uh, phase two, we've uh, chosen uh, courses that are likely to have a high appeal uh, the three courses listed there, Principles of Management, Introduction to Entrepreneurship, and Introduction to Project Management for Phase 2. And then the course uh, schedule for Phases 3 and beyond will be discussed and decided at the International Partners Meeting. I appreciate that the concept of you know, open pedagogy is, is still not well defined and, and is very much a contested concept. But I think it is worthwhile thinking about the things that we can do with open that are harder to do with closed. And much of this thinking has been driving the work we've been doing here at the OERU. One example, of course, is uh, this concept of free range learning, or what uh, Jim Taylor has referred to as the pedagogy of discovery. And admittedly, I accept that that semi-free range learning, you, you'll notice a, a small fence there in the background, and I guess uh, you know, any sort of uh, free range learning approaches have to work within existing constraints. But a good example of this implementation is this idea where learners uh, search for and find uh, open access resources and OVRs in pursuit of their own learning interests in achieving the learning outcomes for courses and the um, regional relations in Australia and Pacific course is a good example of the implementation of this pedagogy. Um, the course covers uh, well 40 plus different countries and uh, it 
would not be easy to assemble a closed or proprietary textbook that would cover 40 countries. But with OER and open access resources, we are able to implement a pedagogy of discovery in a sustainable way. I mean, we've also used the pedagogy of discovery quite extensively with the Learning in a Digital Age course. The other uh, area which is also, also pretty interesting to think about is when we are using OER and you know, open source technologies, to think about how one would actually design and implement a, a learning platform. And, and you know, at the OERU, I think the best way of describing our learning platform is that we use the internet as the delivery platform rather than, rather than a single application like a learning management system. And so this is more or less what our technologies look like. Um, our authoring platform, uh, our partners collaborate and author the course materials on the wiki. And that way we have a version control and are able to collaborate across you know, different countries. Uh, the authors assemble a simple outline uh, in the wiki, which represents the structure of our courses. And uh, our OVRU partners can then request a snapshot, which will then automatically produce a published website on WordPress using a custom OVRU theme. From the learner's perspective, uh, our learners access the course materials on an open website. Uh, from, from our perspective, uh, we do not require password access uh, to the course materials. Um, you know, if, if one applies a password to course materials, they are per definition closed. Uh, we then... Uh, use a number of interaction technologies, best of breed open source technologies that are distributed across the web for various uh, activities and features. And we then, through the use of syndication technologies, generate a live course feed uh, that the learners can consult, which brings all these technologies together. Uh, this uh, technology wheel uh, shows the suite of open technologies that we are using. Uh, we use the discourse engine for discussion forums, uh, Mastodon, which is a, a social media network or open source alternative to Twitter. Learners can uh, choose from a number of blogging platforms, uh, which they use as their own e-portfolios. Uh, we have an internal uh, comment engine called Wiki Educator Notes. Uh, we've also integrated Hypothesis for uh, you know, annotating any page on the web. And we have implemented a social bookmarking technology called Semantic Scuttle, which is uh, an open source alternative to Dijo, which is used as a resource bank for learners to share you know, interesting resources that they find uh, on the web. So let me just let this load. Uh, this is a, a live example of what an OERU course looks like. I just want to point out one or two things there. Uh, we assemble our courses from you know, a number of learning pathways, and that's pretty much what a learning pathway would look like. It consists of a number of sub pages that learners can then navigate through while uh, completing the, the course materials. I just also like to point out one or two examples of learning challenges. We embed a number of learning challenges in the course materials. Uh, so let's have a look here at a resource bank activity. Uh, so I'm going to open that up in a new tab. I'm just going to remove this from full screen. So let's just scroll here. So here's a resource bank activity. It's related to uh, learners finding resources to define digital literacies and uh, digital skills. Uh, they are instructed to go and find resources and then useful links and resources that they find, uh, they will enter, in, uh, enter here on OERU bookmarks, very similar to Dijo. It's a summary of the links that the learners have found um, they can vote, you know, vote for links that they uh, find useful, and this is a way for the learning cohorts to to share resources. Let me also illustrate. Go back here. 
and find an annotation activity. Many of you may be familiar with Hypothesis, which is an open source technology for learners to be able to annotate any web page they find on the web. So let's find the article here. So this is an article that was published by Mahi Bailey on digital skills. So the idea is, let me just activate. This is taking a while to load, but basically what happens is you can go and highlight and annotate any uh, component of the article. Uh, let's see here, that's, that's hidden behind, here we go. So basically how this works is you can go and highlight any section, you can add an annotation. Uh, by adding the course tag, we are able to, the course tag or the OERU course code, we are able to harvest uh, these interactions for the course feed. So you basically get the idea. Learners can also reply to any annotations that have been posted. But just to give you a bit of a flavor of some of the technologies we're using, and uh, let me just illustrate what the course feed looks like. Um, this course is, uh, and even though it's live on the web at the moment, we, uh, this course hasn't run yet, so uh, you'll just see a number of the posts we've been testing for the different technologies. Uh, here, for example, you'll see this is a post that comes from our discussion forum, which is uh, uses discourse. Uh, here is a, a post which comes from Wiki Educator Notes. Uh, here's an example of a bookmark that has been posted. Here uh, is an example of a blog post that was authored on Medium. And uh, basically, from the course feed, learners would be able to go to you know, the actual source on, on the web where this comes from. So I've just clicked through here. And you know, here's an example of the blog post I posted on Medium which is then integrated into the course feed. So that's pretty much what our platform looks like. Uh, let's have a look here. I'm not going to go into all the detailed explanations of the underlying technology. Uh, Dave today posted a blog explaining all the technologies that underpin this. One of the things we do here at the OER use, we actually publish the technical recipes of all the technologies we're using so that any partner that wanted to replicate any of these technologies would be able to do so, uh, because you know, they're all based entirely on open source. So let me leave it there for the moment and open up the floor for any questions or comments. Just a, a brief comment, Wayne. Um, I think it's a very comprehensive um, set of technologies that have been integrated. And um, I think the, the um, minimal viable product that we aim for and the minimum viable platform uh, are looking pretty robust with lots of courseware and uh, lots of options for pedagogies and applications. So. Um, I think it's an impressive demonstration that you've put together. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. Yes, this has come a long way. Um, as, as one thing that characterizes the OERU is the rigor of our planning. Yeah, yeah Wayne, I, carry I on. simply wanted to, to say the same. I, I've um, not been as good at keeping track of what you've been doing and where you've been going and i have to say i'm i am truly impressed in uh, the range of um, technologies that you brought together here and i'm currently tasked with looking at the open university's own internal platforms and planning for the future and i will be taking a really careful look at your blog because um yeah it's a really impressive range of um uh 
technologies that you brought together and it will be really interesting to look at the users as they come in in terms of their feedback on that. Do, will you be running um, an evaluation program in terms of how users are interacting with the technologies and making sense of it? Is that part of the planning? Yeah. So, so one of the things that our first um, or oh, the, the, the founding meeting of OERU partners, we implemented the SIP evaluation model, uh, context, input, process, and product evaluation. So we've actually worked through the, the, the context and input evaluation thus far uh, in helping us design and you know, plan the futures of, of the model. We are now moving into the process evaluation phase. And in fact, at the partners meeting, we will be reviewing the process evaluation plan and helping to tweak and refine that. So yes, um, we will be looking at aspects of, of, of this. We do have some limited analytics. I don't want to use analytics in the sense of, uh, you know, how it's, the concept is being used in, uh, in, in a broader sense, but um, obviously we've got the web stats and uh, we have some built-in components that we will be able to, to see how learners are engaging, um, you know, with the model. Um, the interesting challenge, of course, within the OERU context is because we don't require password registration in order to access the learning materials, uh, there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, but certainly at an aggregated level, we, we will have some information. I mean, I think it's also worthwhile noting this is very much in a kind of an open source design model that is incremental. Um, so, you know, we're working with a minimum viable product, you know, it's just a basic set of core features that we believe would be useful for learning management or, you know, uh, for the delivery of the OERU, which gives a lot of flexibility to tweak. And so what would also be possible for any of our partner institutions, rather than, you know, take a decision to adopt the technology suite, you know, as enterprise technology, it is possible to, you know, run small pilots. Um, and very much, you know, this learn by doing model as, as, as we move forward. I mean, thinking of course delivery outside of a learning management system poses a number of, you know, interesting challenges. And, you know, it's, it's very much a, you know, learn by doing kind of approach. But I really appreciate your feedback, Andrew. Um, it's, uh, it's quite exciting, actually. We, um, one of the other things that we've done is the learning in the digital age course uh, is actually designed. Uh, to help learners find their way uh, and build skills and capacities in using these technologies. So we're hoping that the Learning in the Digital Age course would kind of become an anchor course for learners to start developing the kinds of you know, digital and learning literacies they need in order to succeed uh, in this kind of learning environment. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo again everyone else's comments. I think it's interesting that I think a lot of these tools have reached a level of kind of maturity now that you can give them to students without requiring those students to be kind of like techni technically sort of aficionados and stuff. But also I think the other area that I, I liked was your recent post on the uh, micro-credentialing. So I think that's, uh, as you know, it's an area where we're exploring. I expect lots of other people are as well. So I think that's a really when you put up your your reasons to participate with the OERU, I think it's a way of kind of a kind of sandbox or sort of soft test and a lot of these things that, yeah. that many universities have been sort of grappling with, whether it's technology or um, pedagogy or sort of uh, credentialing uh, recognition yeah. uh, approaches. So I think that's yeah. it's a really good sort of way to come in and try all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thanks for that, Mark. I mean, one one of the things we are learning is this. Um, Sort of, you know, low cost, low risk innovation model. Um, because the exposure for an individual institution to start gaining experience with, you know, these kinds of approaches is, is very low. Um, the risk that is, um, but the potential gains are huge. And I mean, I think that's the power of the network model. You know, we're able to do things here together as a network that are hard to do as, you know, on your own. Blaine, can I just make a comment on, um, on what you just showed us there? I'm, I'm, like everyone else, I'm appreciative of, of the, uh, the integration of a range of technologies and the opportunities that brings up. Something that occurred to me when, when watching that as, as a, um, somewhat of an old fogey, um, I struggle with navigation in many online programs. And um, 
where we have different learners coming in and different courses being developed by different people, here at UHI, we have over 3,000 modules and units. One of the things we constantly struggle with is the balance between having different architectures to suit different types of learning, whether it's art or science or what, what have you, and the desire for some students to have continuity yep. and similarity of, of view and design and, and navigation. Um, I think that for me is going to be one of the um, tipping points, one of the key elements here as to OERU in its entirety, how successful it is, is how fe people feel about engaging with a series of different products uh, with different styles. I'm not saying one way is good or bad, um, that diversity is, can be extremely good, and we certainly have that in UHI, but we constantly have these calls for this, um, some sort of similarity of design, you know, some sort of commonality. Yeah. But I think that's going to be something to watch over, uh, over the coming, coming years. No, I, um, good, good comments, Gary, and I'm in total agreement. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a tough balance to keep, right? Um, you know, having a, a consistent look and feel and a consistent structure for, you know, the, you know across the OERU for all learners, but at the same time not prescribing any pedagogical approach. Um, so it's, it's a fine balance. I mean, the way we've tackled it uh, at the OERU up to now, it might change in the future. But we agreed uh, sort of a high level structure, uh, and it, it was an interesting debate. I mean, things like we call the units of learning, learning pathways, uh, just by one example. And so, that the reason for that was so that it wouldn't compete with the kinds of ter or the different terminology that different institutions have for the smallest units of learning. Uh, so, it was thinking of the whole reuse and uh, kind of scenario there. Uh, we also took uh, a decision early on that every course would have a course guide, um, which, uh, you know, lays out the course aims, you know, sort of the objectives, how, you know, how the assessments would work. And, um, I mean, there's been consistent adherence with all the partners in terms of how they've uh, assembled the courses using that structure. Uh, nobody has complained that they, you know, they had not been able to implement the, the particular pedagogical approach. So, so far, so good. <laughs> but we'll, we'll wait and see, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what the general acceptance will be across, you know, all the learners. But that said, we did run quite a, quite a number of pilot courses before we sort of arrived at the structure. Um, and, you know, each iteration had tweaks to it, you know, just, you know, to get it well and, you know, Folk that teach in these environments will know you get, you know, you learn, you learn through experience. I mean, one of the things you typically then do in these environments is have the standard, uh, please introduce yourself in the course discussion forum kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, kind of model because, you know, if you've got thousands of learners, you know, people will be switched off by all the email they'll be receiving. So, and so, you know, having these distributed technologies where learners can decide how they sip and dip and, um, you know, what they want to concentrate on. Uh, other th things that we can do is we, in LIDA, for example, we help learners in setting up their own uh, RSS feed readers. So then they can decide which learners they want to follow uh, in terms of posts. So they've got a lot more control in terms of how they set up these environments. So, yeah. Wayne, um, Prof. Belfort just joined me, so uh, oh, you also just want to participate, so uh, I welcome Prof. Robert to the meeting. Uh, good day, Robert. Um, welcome, man. Um, welcome. Um, perhaps you just want to say hello? Yes, thank you very much. I'm um, just after you had been done, and so good morning, colleagues. I've uh, taken over from Professor Martin Westhazen as the DVC Teaching and Learning at uh, Northwest University in South Africa. Um, Wayne, I just I had two questions. It was in relation to the um, earlier part of your talk um, around concepts of open pedagogy and free range learning. And I just wondered, I mean, how do these relate to, for example, self-directed learning and and the pedagogy of discovery that you mentioned. So there's a, a big area of scholarship, mostly in the US, I think, around SDL, PBL, problem-based learning, and so on. And be useful to understand with you the 
concepts of free range and open in relation to pedagogy and learning? Uh, a, a very good question, uh, very good question, Robert. Um, Rossi, if you could just mute your mic again, because we're just getting a bit of feedback uh, loop there, feedback echo. Um, I mean, there, there, there's certainly overlap between you know, different kind of pedagogical approaches. Um, possibly what I'd like to do here is let me uh, hand over to Jim, who has been instrumental in thinking about the pedagogy of discovery and its implementation uh, in, at the OERU. And maybe Jim, if you'd like to comment. Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, in setting up the OERU, we had a focus on um, developing independent, self-directed learners as a sort of philosophical position um, because it's, it's lightly supported and it's peer supported. It's not directed uh, to the same extent uh, that a lot of pedagogies are teacher directed. But at the same time, we've embedded a lot of structure. And so with the leader course, for example, I think students are uh, giving, given opportunities to develop skills and familiarity with the technologies that we use that will enable them to become more self-directed. And uh, also in terms of uh, speaking specifically about the pedagogy of discovery, um, in the USQ course on regional relations in Asia and the Pacific, we wanted the students to have the opportunity to select countries uh, that were of interest to them and to an extent certain topics and nuances uh, aimed at the particular objectives of the course. And uh, the fact that we've now got a wealth of open education uh, resources available um, and also we've got frameworks for evaluating and judging the credibility of the source and the like. Uh, we feel that we are able to open up the curriculum uh, to a large extent. So there's some comments which I hope are helpful. I think um, there will be time at the meeting uh, and later in the review of the strategic plan that we uh, have time to discuss this further. So I hope they're helpful, thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jim. And uh, Martin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I know you've been doing some thinking and writing around you know, these, uh, the concepts of open pedagogy. You did put me on the spot, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> you should yeah, have to handle it. <laughs> um, yeah, as you said, there's been quite a bit of debate. You know, there's the kind of more the more strict definition of of, of David Wiley, which it has to use. Uh, it's it's pedagogy that uses OER and then sort of people like Jim Groom who prefer kind of more of a, a mindset approach. Um, but I think it, it's, a, it's a bits that we've been exploring are sort of bringing learning into the, the university. And I, I like the idea of things like a DS106 where they have kind of assignment banks where people can kind of yeah. create their own assignments and then choose from a, a, a bank of those. So I think um, uh, my tendency is to sort of move away from the kind of very strict that has to involve OER and to be more of a kind of a, a taking advantage of the kind of the, the openness of, of the web as an approach. Um, yeah. but, but also you, using things like some of the work that Robin DeRose has been doing with open textbooks, so kind of using an open textbook and then getting students themselves to kind of uh, interrogate that. And I think that's particularly interesting in, in when we have discussions about how to decolonialize the curriculum and those kind of things making that changing that relationship between textbooks and, and what students do I think is a it's a very interesting approach yeah. Yeah. did I did I bluff it enough there I mean, oh, yeah. sterling job sterling job uh, better than I could <laughs> so yeah I mean uh, I mean a lot of our thinking uh, has been driven by the advantages of the open web um, so you know We've got this open web, we've got open resources. I mean, how can we use it in ways that, you know, support learning um, that are harder to achieve with, you know, sort of closed models? I mean, one of the examples that Martin referred to is getting learners engaged in, you know, sort of contributing to the resources themselves. And in LEADER, we will be doing a bit of work where, you know, based on this adage of, you know, if you want to learn something, teach it. 
where we're going to be getting the learners to start generating multiple choice questions uh, you know, that cover the course concepts. And um, we can then start having learners you know, comment and get feedback on those questions. And when, in theory, once you know, these items reach a, a level of st statistical reliability and validity, those items could then potentially be moved into uh, assessment banks for summative assessment. So you know these kinds of things that uh, you know can be incorporated as well. So lots to do and lots to learn as we move forward. Uh, and um, it's going to be an interesting journey for sure. So let me get the screen share back on again and move on with the agenda. I just wanted to note that um, we have distributed a survey for any partner institutions who may be interested in offering assessment services for any of the OERU courses that are included in the first year of study. Uh, it's not a requirement, as I pointed out, um, the OERU model is one where partners retain decision-making autonomy uh, of all uh, aspects of assessment. But what we do want to know is if any partner institutions want to offer assessment services, uh, just to please let us know because we need to make sure that we get all the information uh, updated on the main OERU.org website. Uh, we've also distributed a copy, it's linked there from the agenda of the articulation uh, agreement uh, contract. Um, you're not expected to sign it, it's only the active partners will be signing the transfer agreement that are actually providing assessment services uh, for credit transfer uh, at, at the two partner awards. But it is a useful document nonetheless, because uh, you know once you see how the credit transfer system operates, you'll see that it in fact uh, functions within the uh, you know, existing policies of the majority of our institutions. Um, you know, we've had, uh, at least three of our registrars agree to the contract, so it, it is you know, proof that it's implementable. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, we've had a look at the uh, technology platform. Moving on to the agenda. Oh, let me just stop there. Were there, were there any comments in relation to the credit transfer agreements? Right, let me move on then. So every year we have this uh, open consultation where we collectively determine the agenda for the international partners meeting. Um, the approach that we use is, uh, you know, our partner meetings are best described as planning sprints. Uh, we, we collectively come together, we, we come together and we collectively work on the plans for the forthcoming year. Uh, so in, we develop draft proposals for these plans through actions, for, uh, the proposals for action, and then those proposals are refined in the wiki as, as we move forward. It's a model that has worked very really well for us, and um, you know I, I suggest we should stay with it because it's been working well for us. Uh, the proposed agenda uh, or the items that we ha have listed for the agenda are included here. Uh, this is a standard item we have at each meeting, you know, taking stock of where we're at, finding out what has worked well, what hasn't worked well. Um, we allocate a session to thinking about how we improve our operations and how we work. Um, the key items for this year's agenda would be to determine the uh, courses for the remaining phases of the, uh, the, the launch of the OERU first year of study. Uh, we need to develop a, a marketing strategy and a marketing plan. Um, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with our technology, on the back end, we use an open source automated marketing software engine called Maltech. Um, and what that would enable us to do is we would be able to inject marketing collateral from our partners um, at the point that learners would be considering or ready uh, to consider a decision for assessment. Um, 
And we use this marketing automation engine also for the distribution of email announcements. So learners can opt in to receive email announcements which are administered or automated by this marketing engine. So that's what the sort of the marketing plan is all about as well. Um, there's uh, a working group that's been led by uh, Adrian Stagg from the University of Southern Queensland that is having a look at you know sort of quality guidelines for the OERU. Uh, getting back to An uh, my point I made earlier in answer to Andrew's question, we will be reviewing the process evaluation plan. It's tradition that our host institutions get a, a showcase session at the end of the first day. So I'm in discussion with David Port at eCampus Ontario uh, in terms uh, of what he would like to profile at the, at the meeting. Uh, eCampus Ontario are doing some very exciting stuff around OER. So it, that should be an interesting session. And we also need to move forward with the consultation process of the, uh, the, 20, uh, the strategic plan for 2018 and 2020. So those are the items we have on the agenda. There were also a couple of uh, additional items suggested during our consultation with Oceania and North America. And these are the additional items that were suggested, um, a breakout session or group focusing on uh, our work with Academic Volunteers International. Uh, this is a concept which comes back from what our, our founding meeting, uh, developing a system uh, of volunteers that could help with, uh, you know, providing learner support. Uh, there's an interesting uh, prototype that we're going to be working with. We will be partnering with the peer-to-peer -peer universities learning circles initiative, where they uh, work closely with public libraries who provide face-to-face -face support for open online courses. And so we'll be running a uh, prototype with the learning in the digital age in partnership with the peer-to-peer -peer learning circles group. So we'll be having some discussion around that at the partners meeting. Uh, again, this is an important item, uh, continuing to develop a coherent program of study for the OVRU, you know, moving forward, thinking about the, the assembly of courses for the second year and the third year and the corresponding exit credentials that, um, might come out of the network. Um, a session on environmental scanning, looking at new developments, how they potentially could be leveraged for the OERU partnership. And uh, this was a suggestion that came from Charles Sturt University. Uh, proposals for interpartner collaborations. Uh, we have a rather unique network, and um, it was, you know, Sandra thought it would be a good idea for partners just to have a discussion of, you know, how our network potentially could be leveraged for you know interpartner collaborations you know among within our partner network so those are the points that have been proposed uh, thus far so let me just scroll up here the main agenda point points there and the additional points uh, suggested by the meetings so let me open the floor there for comments and feedback on the items we've got on the agenda and then also any additional items uh, you would like to add. Any comments? Well, I'll start the ball rolling again, Wayne. Um, with regard to the strategic plan 2018-2020, um, I think it would be useful if at the time we could get some guidelines on major initiatives that might um, emerge, you know, from where we are at the moment, from the taking stock. We, we've now, you know, gone a long way to getting the, the first year of study off the grain. I think we, we need to consolidate that first and foremost. But the other thing that might be useful to add in under the strategic plan is in terms of now that we've got a, an, a really interesting platform um, as to whether any institution would like to replicate elements of that platform um, either in terms of creating an interface with existing institutional platforms or re possibly replacing some expensive proprietary component you know with uh, an open source uh, uh, 
element that we've used. And I think that's part of the model where's, that is important in terms of the open business model. And I just wonder whether in terms of looking at the business model, whether that should be also on the agenda in light of the benefits that can flow to members where we're more proactive about um, yeah. technical in, you know, initiatives like that, or as along the lines of the, you know, Sandra's suggestion about partners working more closely together and perhaps on courseware developments. Um, so I know we talk about the five R's and so on. Maybe there's a six R and that could be to replicate some of the technological infrastructure that we've developed. So that's a suggestion um, for consideration. Yep. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jim. All, all valid contributions, and I'll add them uh, to the list in the meeting notes, and we'll work those into the agenda. I think those are excellent suggestions. What I'm just sharing here on screen is just, uh, just an example of the technical recipes um, that, that we post. Um, so this is not for bedtime, necessarily for bedtime reading. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's more the technical side of stuff. So this is the whole uh, architecture that we are using for the feed aggregation. So it's just by way of example, you know, how this all works um, and the technical work. We share all the code that we generate uh, on our you know, open repositories. So it's, it's relatively easy to um, actually replicate any of the technologies that we, we are using and find particularly useful. So I just wanted to point that out uh, for folks that are at the meeting. Thanks for that, Jim. Yes, I've made notes of those. Uh, any other comments? Gender item additions? Taking silence to mean assent. That that sounds that sounds good. So just by way of process, how this works is over the next uh, fortnight, I will start assembling the. Uh, agenda for the partners meeting. Uh, it, the work will be done in the wiki so anybody will be able to see uh, what's happening and, and contribute and provide comments and feedback as the agenda is being assembled. So if uh, new items do come to mind or something you feel that we, we should be discussing that's not there, please don't hesitate to you know leave a note in the wiki and we'll do our best to work that in. So that's in terms of getting the agenda together. The uh, planning for the meeting is progressing well. I just checked uh, before we, we uh, uh, joined this evening. We currently have uh, uh, 31 signed participants for the partners meeting. I just received the registrations from Hamden bin Mohammed Swart University just before we went live so that I'll, they haven't been updated on the meeting website yet. But um, that is all progressing well. Right. So the closing item there on the agenda, I just wanted to note that we have a couple of OVRU presentations at the ICDE World Conference. Uh, there may well be others from the network that are speaking on OVRU. Uh, so if you are aware of any other presentations at the ICDE meeting, that you would like us to add to the list so folk are aware of it. Uh, but it's good to see that uh, OVRU has been accepted or OVRU related presentations have been accepted for a number of the sessions at the ICDE meeting. So that's pretty much it from my side and uh, we finished on time, which is always a good thing. Uh, any closing comments from folk? Yeah, and Andrew, yeah, I, I will uh, uh, circulate a link to the tech blog. That's, 
Um, Wayne, I'm, I'm hoping to be in Canada with you um, in October and, and colleagues in October. I, at the moment, I'm just waiting for permission from our Vice Chancellor here. So uh, that, that registration, I hope, will come through soon uh, from me. But as you know, we're going through a restructuring exercise here, so it's pretty much all hands on deck at the moment, yeah. but I'm hoping yeah. to be with you in, in October. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, and uh, we'll certainly keep our fingers crossed that you, you'll be able to uh, join us in Toronto, and uh, it, it would be good to have you know, active input from our African partners at the meeting. Right, if there are no uh, additional comments, I, I, I wish you um, a good day ahead for those in Europe. Um, I have the fortunate advantage of living in the future that's already happened, and you will have an amazing Wednesday. So thank you very much for joining us, and uh, look forward to seeing a number of you in Toronto. Wayne, Wayne. Can, you me, can you tell me the lottery tickets for later on today? I'll, I'll see you living in the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, as you well know, I, um, I'm a radical open advocate, but I'm not sharing those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you all. Oh, bye. Bye.